Mr. President, the word republic means public thing in Latin. We bring our different perspectives and our different identities together respectfully to make decisions for an entire nation. The United States is a nation with diverse, varied beliefs, different cultural origins, and different politics from the different regions, the different states that we represent. It has been this way from the very beginning, much as some of us imagine otherwise. From the very outset of our republic, there were immense regional differences. Depending on which state someone represented, they might have different views. Now, our republic, and for that matter, any republic ever in the history of republics, has relied on the willingness of the citizenry to be kind. For individuals who play a role in that republic to be kind and respectful and decent to each other, even when, especially when, we disagree with each other. Our founders knew that, and they enshrined it into our Constitution. But as much as anything, they assumed it. And it was on that set of assumptions that the norms enshrined in the Constitution became possible, because without them, they would not be. Without them, none of this would work. You see, the only way our republic can, our, our republic can possibly function now or 250 years ago or 250 years from now. It always has to follow a, a somewhat similar formula. The only way it can function is when citizens and leaders are gracious to those with whom they disagree and grant the freedom necessary to allow others to make choices, even if those choices might be things that they disagree with. We've witnessed the degradation of American political discourse for some time now. It's been a, a sad, tragic reality unfolding, but it's not an inexorable conclusion. It's not one from which we cannot depart, but we must make a choice to do better, to choose a better path. We received a bulletin earlier today, a bulletin from the Capitol Police indicating that all visitors and all House staffers, and in fact, all House members, are required to wear masks indoor, indoors or, or be denied entry or forced to leave the premises. And at least in the case of staff and visitors, if they fail to comply, they'll be arrested, arrested for unlawful entry. Conviction for a violation of this rule will, according to the bulletin, be punished by a fine of not more than $1,000, imprisonment for not more than six months, or both. The Senate, which happens to be housed in the same building as the House, is not subject to these same requirements. But is this decision based on science? Or is it based on the will and whim of the Speaker of the House of Representatives? Whatever the reason, the arrest of peaceful House staffers shows the total loss of political grace in the House of Representatives. I cannot fathom a legitimate reason to arrest a person in this building for not wearing a mask. I cannot fathom a legitimate reason for arresting anyone based on failure to wear a mask. Members are not treated as the legitimate representatives of their constituents, as in fact they are under our system of government, when they're subjected to this kind of manipulation, when they're subjected to this type of oppressive order. Staff under this type of oppressive directive aren't treated as hardworking, dedicated Americans, which truly they are. Instead, everyone who doesn't comply is deemed the enemy of the current House of Representatives. There's no room for disagreement or dissent. It is tragic indeed to see a key deliberative body where dissent and debate are supposed to be tolerated and appreciated and decided and have been not just for decades but for centuries. To see that turned into a place where Disagreement and dissent are disdained 
and punished by arrest. Congress works on collegiality and respect. We need to get back to those basics. Regardless of what you might think about the coronavirus, about the vaccine, about masks, there's never a good reason to arrest someone for not wearing a mask. This decision falls into the larger context of the Center for Disease Control's recent flip-flop on masks and the Biden administration's worrying push toward mask and vaccination mandates. The CDC issued updated recommendations earlier this week starting uh, is, uh, is stating at, at its outset that, that, that masks should be worn indoors in areas of, quote, substantial or high transmission, close quote, even by individuals who have been fully vaccinated. Now, this new guidance claims that, quote, emerging evidence suggests that fully vaccinated persons who do become infected with the Delta variant are at risk for transmitting it to others, close quote. But, Mr. President, one glaring thing is missing from that conclusion. Evidence backing up the CDC's claims. In fact, the CDC didn't publish any new research on the effectiveness of the COVID vaccines against the newer variants when it issued its latest edict. The CDC's website simply cites unpublished data from its own COVID-19 response team when it makes this new, rather significant, rather jarring, rather impactful, and rather unwise claim. The CDC is undermining its own credibility, and thus, I believe, placing public health and safety at risk by going back and forth on recommendations and failing to be upfront about whether there's any actual reliable scientific evidence to support or compel those recommendations. In fact, even when asked questions by members of Congress, the CDC is failing to respond. This is not hyperbole. This is not conjecture. This is based on my own personal experience. I'll point to the fact that on April 24th, more than three months ago, I sent a letter to the Centers for Disease Control asking a very simple question, a simple question that I would hope Anyone here would want to be asked. I wanted to know why is it that when there are so many of our peer nations around the world that don't require masks to be worn on airplanes, for example, by children as young as two, as we do in the United States. You know, many of our peer nations, the mask requirement may not kick in until 10 or 11 years old, or in some cases, five or six years old. But here, the CDC has said that it's got to kick in at two years old. I'd ask the question, did any of these people who made this recommendation, who made that conclusion, that two-year-olds should have to travel with a mask, have they ever known an actual two-year-old? <laughs> have they ever raised a child? Have they ever traveled on an airplane? Have they ever traveled in a car, in a bus, on a train, in the rain, anywhere, with an actual child? This doesn't work. Now, when you add that to the fact that children react to the virus differently than adults do, and that's putting it mildly, when you add that to the fact that this creates other problems for children, not just for those handling them, but for the kids themselves, it makes it especially important to know why. Now, my letter wasn't attempting to make any case. My letter was simply trying to obtain information. You see, because when the CDC makes these sweeping recommendations, and sometimes they like to make them feel easier by calling them recommendations, when in fact they precipitate a whole host of things that feel a whole lot more binding than recommendations. You see, because if you get on an airplane or a bus or a train or you go to a bus depot or a train station or an airport and you've got a two-year-old who won't wear a mask as any red-blooded American two-year-old will not do. You're told that you're subject to arrest and that you're violating federal law if you do that. So it's not unreasonable to ask that they pony up with information. If they're going to make recommendations, they should explain to us what those recommendations are. So I asked them, what scientific proof is there that a two-year-old needs to wear a mask? Well, 
I sent that on April 24th. Didn't hear anything on April 25th or April 26th or the 27th or the 28th, 29th or 30th or any of the days of the months of May or June or July and we're almost to the end of the month of July. They didn't respond to this. I don't know why. Maybe they're really busy doing other stuff. Maybe they're really busy figuring out where they're going to flip flop next and where they're going to issue their next edict that the American people are expected to follow, all in the name of it being science that we have to defer to blindly without any evidence. But this isn't acceptable, and it doesn't inspire confidence, nor does it inspire confidence for an agency that makes these sorts of recommendations that have a really significant impact to flip-flop and not justify its own analysis, not provide even a scintilla of scientific proof for what it did. So let's get back to its more recent flip-flop. The fact that it's flip-flopped this week, coupled with the fact that it hasn't backed up its other claims over the last few months, is understandably troubling to many of us. Especially so when you consider the fact that, in my personal experience, look, I've been vaccinated. I chose to get the vaccine. I respect those who have chosen not to. For many of those I've known who've been reluctant to get the vaccine, who eventually got the vaccine, most of them, I would say, ended up getting it when they realized that certain aspects of life could be made more predictable and more convenient if they did get the vaccine. Many people, when they walked into a hotel lobby or a restaurant or a grocery store or a Costco or a Sam's Club, if they would see signs saying that vaccinated persons need not wear masks, they'd realize there's some benefit there. But if they got the vaccine, they could walk in there and say, well, I don't have to wear the mask. Now, obviously, we don't ever want to get to the point where somebody has to wear an armband to prove whether they've been vaccinated or not. In fact, that would be an absolutely horrifying experiment that we should not attempt. But the fact is that when, when people see that there might be some benefit, as they're more likely to do, if they see that something different will happen in their life if they get the vaccine, they're more likely to get it. But when you're constantly moving the goalposts, you're saying, here are the benefits of the vaccine. Oh, psych, just kidding. We're moving along. We're going to take those away. People are not going to get it. And so if you want more people to get vaccinated, you darn well better have the CDC getting its act together, providing scientific evidence for what the CDC is recommending and what it's not. And so, look, I'm still waiting for answers from the CDC on my April 24th letter. And I'm still waiting for answers from the CDC when it comes to scientific evidence supporting their most recent flip-flop. But while we wait for those answers, and that clock is ticking, I don't know whether we need to start humming the tomb to jeopardy, but they do need to provide those answers. And while we wait for those answers, here are a few principles that I think might help guide some of our discussions. Our government needs to trust Americans to make these decisions some of the most personal decisions that a human being can make for themselves. We need to trust the people's representatives in Congress to make decisions regarding the law. We need to be able to trust each other, to be decent, and to be kind when we disagree. We have to learn from our own history, from our own nature as individuals, and from the history that we've experienced as a nation. We cannot stand by while those in power simply decide on their own whim that they're going to arrest political opponents for disagreeing. You know, at what point did we try, did we decide that it was okay to cross that threshold? I mean, I, I, I get it. We, we always need to be able to, to disagree without bis being disagreeable. Sometimes that's really hard. Sometimes all of us fall a little short of that mark. But I think all of us should be able to agree that we shouldn't arrest those who disagree with us merely because they disagree with us. That's wrong. We're better than that. This time calls for more political understanding and hearty, legitimate 
debate, not blind mandates and manipulation. We have to remember that at its heart, at its core, government is not deity. It's neither omniscient nor omnipotent. Government doesn't have eyes to see you. It doesn't have arms with which to embrace you. It doesn't have a heart with which to love you. Government is force. It's the official use of coercive force. Now, we need that. We need that to protect safety, to make sure that we don't hurt each other, that we're not harmed by others, that we don't take each other's possessions. But we've got to be very careful about how we operate it, because otherwise force is just force. And if we start arresting everyone with whom we disagree, we're not going to be able to do the things we need to do, which is to make sure that government's there to prevent people from hurting each other and taking each other's things. We need to be kind to our neighbors, even when, especially when, we disagree. We need to be helpful and caring to those around us, even if they vote, feel, believe, or even act very differently than we do. We must not allow for arrests and mandates to members of Congress and their staffs without providing sufficient evidence. And yet, all of this stuff uh, goes both ways. We, we, we all need to be respectful of each other's opinions. But look, we're not talking here about activity that by its very nature is so harmful that it warrants the use of blunt political force in the form of an arrest. I cannot fathom a circumstance in which it's ever appropriate to arrest another human being for not wearing a mask, COVID or no COVID. That's not arrest material, Mr. President. In Congress and across the country, what we need now is a return to American graciousness, our way of life, and our precious republic are at stake. Thank you, Mr. President.